just get the notification that uh, it's being recorded. Sorry. Um, so there are not that many uh, overview studies. The larger part of the literature focuses on particular types of innovations. Uh, so for example, the impact of uh, replacing double blind review procedures with a fully transparent form of uh, review. Um, and then when you look at the relatively few overview studies that are out there, you find that they usually adopt one of two uh, dominant perspectives. So on the one hand, uh, there is research written from an activist perspective in the sense that it uh, usually assumes that uh, the peer review has a problem that needs to be fixed. So for example, it suffers from bias or from a lack of transparency or from escalating uh, uh, misconduct that it fails to, to uh, detect. Um, and then these studies try to gauge the effectiveness of innovations in fixing peer review. Uh, another type of study focuses primarily on the question of the uptake and incorporation of uh, peer review innovations into um, into the, the editorial uh, and review practices of journals, uh, the editorial routines. And here, um, the conclusion is often that peer review actually doesn't change that much, so that innovation doesn't really trickle down to journals, as it were. Um, our own aim with this project is a bit different from both of these perspectives. So we don't try to, to assess the effectiveness of innovations in repairing uh, peer review. So we feel that, that research and, and, and review practices are quite varied across fields, uh, which makes it actually problematic to make uh, generalized statements about what is wrong with it. Um, and secondly, we do not treat journal editors as uh, obligatory passage points in innovation. So we are more interested in analyzing the constitutive effects of innovation. So what practices they give rise to, and perhaps also what new practices that don't necessarily have um, an equivalent in existing conventions. So we really focus on innovations as distinct objects of uh, study. Um, and there are good reasons for that. Uh, so one is that, that even, um, even if innovations are not uh, you know, widely adopted or not immediately adopted, they can serve to reimagine the status quo of publishing and review practices. They can serve to uh, problematize how, how we currently do things. They draw attention to what is usually taken for granted, uh, which in turn can untie conventions of practice and thereby actually enable longer term uh, reconfiguration of practice. So it's not uh, always the case necessarily that innovations you know, solve some clearly defined problem. It's also, uh, we would argue the case that they can themselves uh, be an agent of change. And innovations are of course also sociologically interesting for all sorts of reasons. For example, because they can play a role in how um, actors position themselves in the publishing ecosystem. So publishers can use innovation to demonstrate added value um, at a time when there is a critical discourse about big publishers and also researchers themselves may use uh, peer review innovations as a way of trying to promote certain shifts in uh, the epistemic culture of the field. So innovation is frequently more than simply a change in review practice itself. Um, the data for our project was collected through a survey that we, that we sent to a broad uh, range of actors, as I said before. Um, and in the data collection, when one had made, to sh made sure to uh, contact um, the big publishers, uh, but we also relied on a lot of uh, snowballing to get the survey to other types of actors, uh, uh, you know, academic editorial boards uh, and various um, yeah, not-for-profit actors. Um, the service is certainly not, you know, a, a sort of a comprehensive systematic uh, uh, kind of look at what is out there, but certainly allows for interesting, uh, for identifying interesting trends, uh, we feel. In total, we uh, have received 102 responses, so self-defined innovations by 84 respondents, which means that uh, some respondents did more than one uh, initiatives, and we described the material according to to an inductively developed, uh, we call it a taxonomy, based on, um, I'm not sure if it's, it's the best word actually, um, uh, it's based on five main categories. So for example, what is the object of review? How are reviewers recruited? Does the innovation entail specific review foci? And I will uh, discuss these dimensions in more detail as, as I go along. Here is a, a screenshot of the Excel file that we used to, to compare and, and visualize uh, the submissions, uh, where they're all described and broken down according to, uh, to these five um, main categories or differentiating dimensions. And uh, the nice thing here is that this, um, 
way of handling the data allows us to also capture uh, potentially emergent effects of initiatives. So instances where elements of review practice are reconfigured, um, even if they're not the explicitly stated aim of the innovation um, as such. Okay, so the, the first analytical dimension is what is being reviewed? So what is the object of review uh, in a given uh, innovation project? And here it's interesting to note that there are only two um, initiatives focusing on so-called registered reports. So that's uh, a system where you submit a research design, uh, where you spell out the hypothesis and your research methods for review, and then later you submit the actual results. And that uh, forces you to stick to your research design. It's meant to, to prevent uh, selective use of, of data and um, what is considered an opportunistic reframing of research questions. And perhaps because it's essentially a disciplining instrument, it focuses mostly on fields where there is an established uh, discourse about uh, misconduct and research waste. So it's more of a, a niche uh, thing at this point. More common are initiatives that expand uh, the focus of peer review to include not just manuscripts, but also um, data sets and source code. Uh, so we have, for example, five uh, initiatives in our sample that encourage uh, the position of data. Um, and then very common um, since recently are uh, preprints. Um, but at the same time, this is far from, from homogeneous uh, practice. So on one hand, there are dedicated and partly pioneering uh, platforms like Archive, of course, and then later uh, BioArchive and MetArchive, where preprints can be posted potentially in uh, parallel to journal submission, but in principle, uh, independently of, of journals. Um, and yeah, some initiatives also actually build on these pioneering platforms. So some uh, innovation projects submitted uh, as part of our sample, um, and, and they provide additional uh, functionalities to these uh, platforms, which indicates in turn uh, the status of these uh, platforms as a widely used infrastructure. So new projects are already building on these existing uh, platforms which have acquired a sort of an infrastructural character. For example, SciRate, pre-review, which allow users to, to recommend, review, and comment on preprints. And a few platforms also integrate um, preprint deposition and peer review in a single unified platform like F1000 Research and eLife. Uh, and then finally, um, and this is probably uh, yeah, a more recent development, uh, big publishers nowadays also offer uh, optional preprint deposition for journals in their portfolios, for example, Spring and Nature and Empopress um, with platforms like InReview and uh, Review Commons. And this implies really significant scale because these services are then offered really across the entire portfolio of the publishers on an optional basis. Um, the second main category that we use to, to differentiate innovations is the role of uh, reviewers. And the first question that we ask here is, uh, are there any explicit criteria uh, someone should need to act as reviewer? And we have two journals in our sample that include patients as reviewers, uh, which is an interesting experiment. Of course, these are journals uh, with a focus on yeah, biomedical research. Um, and then we have a substantial amount of evaluation that is carried out by professional staff in um, publishing companies and or organizations that operate uh, preprint service. For example, preprint publishing uh, usually requires some kind of screening of submissions for you know, adherence to some formal guidelines, but also a topical fit to some extent. And uh, regarding journal publishing, most big publishers, of course, arrange nowadays for an initial screening of manuscripts for plagiarism. Uh, language use, images, uh, and also uh, thematic fit. Uh, and this is done by publisher staff uh, and the use of AI. And only after that, uh, editors take over to, to screen manuscripts and uh, you know, invite reviewers and yeah, um, induce a more domain-specific uh, review process. And this uh, presupposes a distinction of technical and substantive evaluation criteria. So, um, um, forms of, of review, forms of evaluation that are labeled as technical can be delegated to professional staff, uh, where substantive review is reserved for domain specialists. And of course, the distinction is not always clear cut and sometimes, um, yeah, quite, uh, quite fuzzy. A related question is how are reviewers selected? So for example, are they, are they picked by, by editors or can they sign up individually? And um, here, an interesting finding is that there's a large number of initiatives that involves um, access reviewed forums. So for example, in connection to 
um, to preprint deposition and often on top of commissioned reviews. So that means that um, that users need to, to register and can then, for example, comment on preprints. Um, and that also means that review tasks are um, self-assigned uh, in contrast to, to a scenario where um, an editor identifies and assigns uh, suitable uh, reviewers to a manuscript on a case-by-case -case basis. And it's not always completely clear uh, what form of verification of identity and competence is, is done before uh, users are, you know, then um, basically allowed to, to use the form or how thorough to check it. Um, there are also some initiatives that give reviewers the possibility to invite co-reviewers, typically in the context of mentoring them. So senior reviewers mentoring uh, junior reviewers. Um, that's a different principle to access reviewed forums because here uh, reviewer recruitment relies more on, you know, disciplinary structures and acquaintances among uh, researchers and therefore also more on uh, disciplinary gift economies, you might say. And um, then there are also initiatives on the way to diversify reviews in uh, geographic and uh, demographic terms, uh, but these are generally based on uh, incentivizing measures rather than on setting, you know, minimal thresholds. So it's usually an encouragement to editors or to, you know, editorial board members to, to um, um, try and, and have sort of, uh, yeah, suitably diverse um, reviews assigned to manuscripts. Um, if peer reviews performed by multiple review actors, do different reviewers also have different tasks and responsibilities? Uh, again, uh, initial screening of manuscripts and uh, preprints for plagiarism, for language use, and so on is often delegated to publisher staff before submissions are passed on to journal editors. It's a basic division of labor. Um, for review processes and forums, um, there will be, we suspect, often an emergent self coordinating uh, dynamic at play where individual comments build on each other. So one um, person you know, comments on one part of the preprint, for example, and then somebody else comments on the comment. Um, this carries the risk of uh, imbalances in review folk kind principles, since there's no um, central authority in the shape of the editor to, to, to steer reviews and to consider all, to make sure that all elements of a submission are you know, considered in equal measure. Um, ECR mentoring for junior reviewers potentially also affects uh, distribution of reviewer tasks, since it implies uh, an authority relationship with, um, um, between reviewers. Um, another main category is the nature of reviews. What kind of review criteria does a given innovation initiative imply or specify? And uh, preprints, review of preprints obviously tends to be based on a uh, journal agnostic review, given that they're not connected to any particular journal, uh, although it's not always completely clear um, that this is also part of an epistemic strategy. So sometimes it's perhaps simply a result of how the platform you know, is set up. And it's, of course, also not clear whether reviewers always uh, also stick to this uh, requirement of journal agnostic review. Uh, they might also, of course, simply revert to a disciplinary uh, review, uh, review style. Um, but there are also three journals in our sample that, that explicitly mandate soundness only review as part of an explicit epistemic strategy. So reviewing a manuscript uh, in terms of fit with the journal profile is seen as a distortion of peer review in this case. Um, and some innovations, also quite a few innovations, uh, add special review criteria on top of traditional conservation. So reproducibility is very common and or the inclusion of uh, source data. For um, peer review mentoring initiatives, review criteria are more likely based on uh, disciplinary review conventions because of the one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring of a junior reviewer by a senior reviewer, in contrast, again, to forum-based uh, review, which is less likely to be based on uh, journal or even disciplinary review conventions because the forums do not necessarily map onto um, journal communities. But again, um, I should add that um, most cases of, uh, uh, of, of, of forum-based uh, review are on top of commission reviews. Um, okay, the final main category focuses on questions of openness and transparency. So are review reports made available? Is the identity of reviewers made public and so on? And that's a major area of innovation, but again, um, a very heterogeneous practice. So we don't see a singular development here towards a singular notion of transparency. Um, a substantial number of publishers and also individual journals offer the possibility of publishing review reports of accepted manuscripts, 
usually on an optional basis. The same goes for uh, disclosing review identities. That's usually optional. Um, and some journals also at the same time have actually moved away from uh, single blind towards double blind uh, peer review due to concerns with bias, often um, in particularly prestigious journals. And there are also some uh, special configurations where uh, reviews are published while moving away from single blind to double blind peer review. And um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, the, the very final sub point on this heading is um, transferable review. So that's a system where um, a rejected submission is passed on uh, to, to another journal alongside the review reports. And that's on one hand uh, related to, to creating transparency, but also a measure to manage peer review as an economy. And um, a variation of this are systems where manuscripts are uh, submitted to, to a family of journals uh, whose editors then collectively decide which exact uh, journal should handle the manuscript. Uh, so here, the, the selection of a suitable uh, outlet is done by editors themselves rather than by authors. And we didn't get a ton of information on this type of innovation. It is something that is going on. Some publishers really try to offer it on a broader basis, partly also as, um, as part of their preprint platform. So referee preprints, for example, and review comments uh, can be sent to partner journals alongside the reviews. Um, but it's far from per pervasive at this point. And a potential difficulty here is that um, researchers don't want to have negative reviews sent on to, to a new journal. Um, okay, so yeah, we're still in the process of, uh, of writing our paper, but we, uh, we certainly can already draw some, some conclusions we feel. The first one is that experimentation with the object of review can be seen to, to create additional transparency by multiplying uh, review foci and review occasions. So for example, by enabling a uh, review of preprints in parallel to manuscript review, by including a review of source code of uh, data that a manuscript is based on. Uh, is based on. Um, so it's not simply a shift of review focus, but really a net increase in review work. And perhaps related to this, uh, many innovations in uh, the category's role of review and nature of review entail uh, increasing the versatility and mobility of review actors. Um, and this can work in, in uh, multiple ways. One possibility is by uh, introducing or reinforcing distinctions of technical and substantive review, whereby uh, tasks you know, that, that are labeled as technical can be delegated to, to staff or to AI. Uh, it can also work by removing uh, disciplinary or uh, social boundaries that hamper the ability of certain actors to review. So for example, um, access reviewed forums only require registration, but then allow users to self-assign uh, review tasks and not necessarily on the basis of a, of a disciplinary community structure, but on, on the basis of a platform structure. And uh, sometimes increasing mobility, uh, and versatility of review actors is a side effect of an innovation focusing on epistemic aspects. So for example, soundness only review is on one hand a strategy to avoid gatekeeping, but also has an economic dimension uh, by decoupling review work from journal communities. And uh, yeah, then we also found that there's not a linear development towards an agreed upon definition of transparency, which uh, is probably not a surprise to, to a lot of uh, people in, in the panel, but rather, you know, diverse and often field and journal specific trends. So making review reports and review identities transparent is mostly optional. And there's also a parallel trend towards double blind peer review in the context of journal publishing. And perhaps it's actually easier to publish review reports than uh, identities. Um, as I said in the beginning, the project was not designed to, to study uh, the uptake of innovations, but we still feel that we can indirectly say something about the effects of innovation activity on practices on the ground. And um, on one hand, there is uh, there's always this, the suspicion that you know, not that much is actually changing in practice. Um, it's a finding of previous uh, research in any case. Um, but it is quite clear in principle that the big publishers are engaged in a lot of innovation projects. Uh, to be fair, these are usually optional for users, uh, but therefore also scalable across large parts of uh, their portfolios. That suggests a lot of uh, evolutionary development, but development nonetheless. Uh, only a minority of innovations really requires users to subscribe to particular reform projects like registered reports. 
um, that's more disruptive and therefore usually more, more niche and happens on a more circumscribed level. The very final observation uh, we would like to offer is that it's interesting that most innovations can be described actually in terms of established labels like registered reports, like preprint publishing, like uh, cross review commenting. So it's not completely free form innovation that we're dealing with, but innovation along established lines of alternative practice, which suggests that innovation you know, has been going on long enough to have certain uh, history in its own right. And uh, this is where I end and uh, I look uh, yeah, forward to questions. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Thanks very much, Wolfgang. Um, so uh, before we uh, move on, perhaps we could deal with a couple of questions which we've got and which have been uh, contributed by members of the audience. So um, first of all, there's a question from Mario Malitsky, who is asking about, I guess, the, the motivations behind some of these innovations, asking particularly about uh, innovations which have the objective of increasing quality of peer review. But have you come across that or indeed any other particular motivations in the data that you're looking at? Yeah, um, it wasn't really the focus uh, of the research, but I would guess it's usually a combination uh, of uh, motives. Uh, it's, the problem is it's really analytically hard to separate what really uh, you know, uh, motivates uh, the particular innovation initiative. In some cases, it's relatively clear. So there are um, often, um, so academically driven projects um, often have the aim of, you know, dealing with some kind of a widely perceived problem in the field, like uh, particular forms of misconduct. You have that a lot in psychology, which is partly responsible, I think, for um, um, the interest in registered reports in psychology. For big publishers, it's always yeah multiple uh, motivations. On one hand, of course, uh, simply well improving peer review, but at the same time as a way of uh, demonstrating uh, value, you could say to, to academics, uh, um, test new business models, um, uh, make uh, practice, make uh, uh, existing business models more efficient, make existing infrastructure more efficient. Um, so yeah, a whole range of motivations. It's it's really a tricky tricky question. So. Uh, yeah, uh, I have to be brought as well in my answer, I think. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, and also a question from uh, Cecilia Tilly, who asks about, are there any innovations uh, in your data around reviewers getting paid or somehow being allocated resources for, for doing their reviews, which is a rather different business model from the conventional one, isn't it, of peer review? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, we didn't have um, we didn't have um, um, instances submissions that really uh, are based on a pay for review uh, model, as it were. But we have a couple of submissions that reward um, reviewers with APCs. So it's a way of connecting basically review work to publishing of the reviewers. So the reviewers are paid with a discount basically on their next future publication in a given platform which is an interesting uh, phenomenon and uh, possibly more disruptive than it might at first uh, sight look like. So um, you could argue that a lot of review work is based on, on a sort of a, on a gift community on the idea that you should repay, you know, the work that a journal has invested in you by reviewing yourself. And we don't, we don't really know what happens when uh, this kind of uh, cycle of indebtedness is all of a sudden supplemented by a currency based uh, transactions. So, so does it make people feel that they don't have to review for a journal if they already, you know, paid uh, for a review, for example? So there's all sorts of interesting questions uh, related to that. But I'm afraid I'm, I don't have a yeah very definitive answer on this. No, uh, thanks very much. That's that's brilliant. So thank you. Do keep your um, comments and questions coming in as the uh, presentations progress. What I suggest we do now is move on to our second speaker. Uh, Victoria Yan from ASAP Bio, who's also um, uh, going to give us uh, her perspective on a project that overviews innovations uh, in this space as well, uh, reimagine and review. So over to you, Victoria. Welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Stephen, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Wolfgang, for presenting the results of the survey. I found it very interesting uh, to hear how you categorize the innovations. 
So um, my name is Victoria Yan, and I'm the coordinator of Rematch and Review at ASAP Bio. And uh, we have been following with close attention to the emerging peer review experiments uh, that has been uh, coming up in the last few years, especially paying close attention to experiments that are enabled by the rapid open dissemination of research through preprints. So this publish first and validate curate later model allows the uncoupling of events that are traditionally entangled in journal peer review. So what previously took place, perhaps in a black box behind closed doors, can now be tackled, implemented separately after the open dissemination of a preprint. So now there's a transition from peer review and curation as a gatekeeping mechanism of scientific research to um, becoming a earlier provider of feedback to research and also providing additional context for readers. So what we see now is the shift of peer review to meet the demands of researchers. And as researchers, what we want, um, which is improvements on the peer review process on both preprints and journals alike. So in that sense, as authors, we want to decide when the work becomes public. And there's also increasing demand for open, transparent, reusable research, sorry, reusable peer review. And this will be more efficient and also more constructive. And lastly, curation uh, of primary research will be used to sort uh, research into lists. This will provide context, and this can take place after publication, after dissemination, and after peer review. So the curation activity can also be more inclusive and involve more than two to three reviewers. So at Reimagine Review, we've been uh, tracking both active ongoing experiments as well as proposals in uh, peer review innovations. So since our launch in 2018, we have seen a growing number of new projects and experiments that are addressing a lot of challenges that are toward, working towards increasing transparency, efficiency, and many of them are built on a framework of reviewing preprints. Especially in the last year, many new projects such as Rapid Review's COVID-19, the novel coronavirus comp research compendium, and Rapid uh, Pre-Review outbreak, um, si outbreak Science has come onto the stage to organize the review of a growing number of COVID-19 preprints. So this community, through producing peer review that is public on preprints, are finding themselves uh, answering the question of what is the purpose of peer, uh, peer review? So they can be used in uh, new use cases and in by new users. So uh, in this case, compared to journal publication process and in which peer review is used to inform the decision of an editor in a accept and reject decision, the review now can be used to provide earlier constructive feedback. And in the recent research of bioarchive users, many preprint authors want to share their research uh, in a faster and uh, more quickly, as well as receive feedback on their work. Also, this peer review report and open peer review can act to highlight and curate uh, the research. And this is in fact an old idea. Um, at the dawn of peer review, it was thought that peer review reports can be used as publicity for the research. And lastly, we're of course confronted with um, information overload. So the rate at which preprints are shared um, per all papers is growing at an exponential rate. So uh, to, to meet all of these challenges, uh, what we need to do is to grow a community of uh, peer review uh, peer reviewers of, open, of uh, preprints. So uh, the peer review uh, innovations we've been tracking at Reimagine Review are, uh, the, are leading this effort at growing this community infrastructure. So they are also diversifying the, re uh, the reviewer pool. And especially um, pre-review has been very active in the mentorship program by mobilizing earlier career researchers in the review activity, as well as pre-lice um, involving early career researchers to provide highlights on preprints. And in addition, we have been seeing an increase in geographical representation of peer reviewers. So TCC and Africa Archive are growing the capacity for uh, peer review and curation in Africa. And another really interesting example is this cross-institutional journal club that's harnessing journal clubs uh, to provide review of preprints. And of course, what we need to do is to connect all of these different communities to the projects. And what that needs is better discoverability and better uh, understanding of the up, up and coming uh, peer review projects. 
So uh, we need a way to organize these peer review projects. And this, this has definitely uh, been a challenge uh, in Reimagine Review, as we're seeing uh, many new projects coming up with new terminology for the activity that they perform. So to come up with a standardized way to describe this activity, we can then increase the awareness and understanding of this review projects. And once we have that, this will encourage participation to, commun to connect communities to the, uh, to the projects. This will enable recognition of the review as scholarship once uh, we can understand uh, what review has taken place. And this enables also review reusability and help editors in identifying potential reviewers if we can have better uh, visibility of the reviews and reviewers. So to this end, um, what we have been working together on with a group of publishers, technologists, and uh, um, preprint server representatives is to develop a taxonomy to classify the peer review uh, activities. So the scope of this taxonomy is to describe uh, transparent post-dissemination preprint review services. And we want to capture uh, the, all the different new activities that is performed by the peer review services to inform readers in what has taken place for a given peer review uh, on a preprint. So uh, in, in this, to this end, we have developed this current draft of the peer review taxonomy. So uh, in addition to what Wolfgang has uh, described before in the previous taxonomy, we are interested in other uh, aspects, which is the review coverage. And also um, one thing that we've um, been uh, thinking a lot about is competing interests in this, uh, in this field. So what we can imagine is to uh, implement this taxonomy uh, on, a on a level where reviews are aggregated. So the, uh, where, will we, where we will be piloting this particular taxonomy is early evidence space, society, and reimagined review. So early evidence space is a platform launched by Emble where uh, referee preprints can be discovered. And society uh, introduces a curated list of uh, evaluated preprints. So uh, once we can uh, easily distinguish uh, uh, which uh, review uh, service and what type of review process uh, they perform, then this can help us understand better what they, what they do. And this can help um, researchers in understanding all of this new experimentation that's happening in the space. So of course, improving the intelligibility and understandability of these projects is very important and could increase adoption. But what we think is very important in this uh, field in general is providing actual incentives. And this we've found has been very difficult for many projects. And this is a very similar question to what can incentivize people to perform peer review in general. So uh, at ASI Bio, we have launched two new pilots to tackle this question. So the first one I would like to introduce is the ASAP Bio Peer Reviewer Recruitment Network. So during this pilot, uh, researchers can submit their, peer re their preprint review uh, sample to, to our partner journals who are looking for reviewers. So this can connect uh, the reviewers and help them break into the uh, review activity, especially for early career researchers. And this also provides publishers and journal and access to a pool of reviewers using their peer review on preprints as, uh, as a sample, as recognition of their experience and their work. And the second one that uh, we are piloting is a crowd review trial. And this has been inspired by the crowd review model at Simlet. So we want to use, uh, so what this is, is that the author comes in to the review of their preprint. And within seven days, a crowd of interested researchers can participate and collectively leave comments and feedback on the preprint. And that will be synthesized as a public peer review uh, through BioArchive's uh, trip um, uh, mechanism. So through this, we want to learn whether this format will be an engaging uh, format for researchers to participate in generating public peer review on preprints. So overall, um, I would like to say what we see is that peer review is rapidly adapting to meet the needs of researchers. It's increasingly becoming more modular, more inclusive, and more flexible. And a lot of this is enabled by review preprints. And secondly, what is important in this field of many experiments is that we need to understand what they do and help uh, them become discovered by researchers. So uh, we will, we will uh, do this through piloting the preprint review taxonomy on early evidence-based society and reimagine review. 
And uh, we're at ASAP Bio, we're actively uh, experimenting in trying to understand how can we provide better incentives for the community to participate in open preprint review. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And much of this work is also the work of my colleagues, uh, Jessica and Arachi at ASAP Bio. So any questions, um, please uh, ask me in the Q&A. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, really uh, useful and interesting overview. So thank you. Um, we've got a, a, um, a comment from Mario in, in the chat, and maybe that gives rise to um, uh, an interesting issue that you touched on, which is the idea of crowd reviewing, as opposed to the traditional, if you like, model of one, two, three gatekeepers reviewing and the, the different pros and cons of each of those. Mario implies that it's more likely in a crowd based situation that errors might be spotted, for example. Um, so, so how do you feel, it, you know, what's the evidence base in relation to the pros and cons of crowd versus the more traditional um, gatekeeper? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the traditional gatekeeping type of peer review, where the reviewers are selected by editors, I think in that case, the editors can be confident that these are experts. Uh, in the case of crowd review, it's very much relying on the re reviewers themselves in judging their own uh, abilities and their expertise and self-nominating them in this process. And uh, in that sense, I think maybe potentially uh, more meta reviews and inter-reviewer uh, ratings can help us identify uh, whether these reviews are of good quality. But I think a great advantage to this crowd review approach is that we're diversifying the reviewer pool and that overall can reduce uh, inherent bias. And it, I think it allows um, it allows the reviewer pool to be much greater. So we can um, so we can much, make it a much more uh, engaging process. And I think uh, another advantage in the crowd review aspect is that uh, reviewers, if they don't have so much time, they can focus on a specific aspect of the paper that they're an expert on. They can say, I'm not a particular biochemistry expert, but I'm great at statistics, so that we can actually harness uh, researchers' expertise in targeting specific aspects of the paper. Um, so these are some of my first thoughts. Okay, thanks, yeah. Um... Nicholas DeVito has got an interesting uh, question relating to, I guess, the connection between reviewing of preprints and reviews carried out by journals and the extent to which, and this is a question I know that's been dealt with in a number of areas, the extent to which the review of preprints can be, uh, can inform, if you like, the triage of papers mm -hmm. at, at a journal level as well. Um, so that it's, 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 it's playing a role in that kind of the process. Do you have any views about that? Yeah, I think, um, I think of course, uh, the, the initial preprint review can help the triage, the traditional journals, identify who potential reviewers could be. But I also think in the ideal situation, much of this reviews that are performed on preprints could be directly used. Um, by journals, for example, in the process of review comments, where these reviews are directly used by the journals to inform the decision. Or another great example is the PCI friendly peer community in friendly journals that use uh, the reviews generated by peer community and directly without additional review. And that greatly uh, increases the efficiency of the peer review process and reduces review waste. So um, yeah, these are, I see as great compliments to the existing journal process. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in the question that Bianca uh, Trova raises, and, and I don't know whether other speakers as well as Victoria would like to uh, address this, which is um, to do with um, incentivization uh, of conducting peer reviews, and particularly the extent to which the peer review itself can be considered to be an academic output, <clears throat> which is, I guess, the case um, in relation to uh, open peer review, where that may be a more obvious case. Um, but it's still seen as a, if you like, a public good rather than something that's uh, maybe that could contribute to your um, uh, you know, your, your academic promotion or tenure or whatever it happens to be. Victoria, do you have a view on that? But also if there are other speakers who'd like to chip in, I'd be interested to hear 
from you as well. So Victoria, you first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, of course, I think uh, what is important is for uh, funders and for institutions to openly discuss the value of peer review and uh, this as an actual output and, and a part of our scholarly work. So um, I think this is still um, very much lacking. I think there needs to be many more open and public statements and encouragements of researchers and to know that uh, this work will be recognized as um, an actual research output. Um, and I think another aspect of this is that the, peer, the open review is uh, enabling the recognition. If the review work is not open, not published, and not visible anywhere, then how, when and how will this work ever be recognized? So I think step one is to, for this work to be public and also for it to be uh, discoverable. Yeah. Do any of the other speakers have a view on, on that as peer review, if you like, a peer review reports as part of the um, recognized scholarly discourse as an output in their own, in their own right? Um, Samia, yeah. Stephen, hi, this is Samia. Yes, I completely agree. Um, I, and I think that publishing peer review reports offers so many benefits. You know, it offers insight into the credibility and strength of the peer review process, context for, for the study, but also so importantly, uh, recognition for recognition of scholarly output for the, the peer reviewer themselves. But I don't think we have a system yet of, of a taxonomy, if you will, for reports, a way of actually, and so I think, I think we're putting this out. I do believe that institutions are paying more attention to diverse forms of scholarship, um, but I don't think it's become quite systematic yet. It hasn't become embedded in the culture. Mm, thanks for that. John, if you got anything you'd like to add? Um, just a little, um, I would agree with Samia that nothing has become embedded in the culture, but I think there's a lot of scrutiny being given to what's happening in other communities, particularly around um, information science or computer science. I'm thinking of things, I think, I think it's called, um, is it Stack Exchange, uh, uh, an online um, um, community, I suppose is the best word, where people um, discuss issues and they rate each other's contributions to that discussion. Um, and so people rise in the sort of community level, of, in the estimation of the community, based on the perceived quality of, of their contributions. Um, the peerage of science now, sadly, um, folded up, but started some years ago by Yanis Apanen, actually had that component built into it, um, using um, where peer reviewers looked at other people's peer reviews and, and made assessments of them. So there were the sort of small beginnings of this kind of internal evaluation, um, but it's never risen to the level of um, anything formal and certainly not to the level of anything that counts in, academic, in an academic sense. But who knows, that may well evolve. Mm, yeah, thanks. And Wolfgang? Yeah, we, uh, we had a couple of uh, um, projects uh, that, that um, reward videos by making reviews uh, citable. There is also a couple of cases where particularly good reviews are published as sort of independent contributions in journals as with yeah, putting a spotlight light on them. And then personally, what I like, uh, that's not in, in our sample, but there is a journal in, in my own, own field of science and technology studies, which um, it's called social epistemology. And it has like a system where um, authors and reviewers are encouraged to have uh, uh, an open exchange in a, in a sort of forum after publication of a paper, uh, which gives them a chance to elaborate on, you know, uh, well, on, on the review process, basically, on their arguments uh, that they exchanged also as part of that. Uh, and they're also citable, and it's a way of um, yeah, connecting review work to publishing, which makes reviewers more likely to do it. And it's also really interesting, and it um, sort of uh, gives also rise to, to really uh, 
uh, an exchange among individuals, which is also nice for building uh, something that uh, that uh, because peer review is often yeah based on uh, experiences of mutual indebtedness, right? So that's that's that social component is also very important, I think, uh, and it's something that can be promoted through publishing uh, review uh, reports. Mm. Yeah, mm. thank you. Now, Bianca, you wrote you raised this issue, and I think I can, uh, if you're able to, allow you to to talk and switch your mic on. So do go ahead if you want to expand on this. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, hello, everybody. Yes, okay, we cool. can. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, regarding um, the, the point of incentivizing reviews, um, I actually recently uh, made a proposal um, on the blockchain, um, uh, with blockchain technology. And there are also several parallel proposals that use blockchain technology in order to decentralize the peer review system. And, and I think open access is really important, but also we should consider um, that maybe uh, younger researchers don't want to be uh, overexposed in their reports and, and also to avoid some uh, social cognitive biases. It would be nice to have a system that can combine the open access uh, even during the process of uh, a paper been published, so not just after the paper is published, with a double blind system. And this could be possible through cryptography. And that's why uh, with my project and also other similar projects that leverages uh, distributed ledger technology, you basically can have uh, accountability on who is actually performing the reviews. And, but at the same time, uh, anonymity in terms of the identity because you could use cryptographic caches and in terms of the incentives, um, the main idea circulating is through using token economics. So you could have a community around a platform that has a specific uh, uh, token, uh, which is basically um, a factum of, uh, it's, a, it's a value that can be redistributed and can have a voting power. And, and it's something like uh, when you have a, an author that uh, proposes a, a paper, the community can see like already is happening with preprints, right? It's something that happens, for example, if you have uh, people commenting on bioarchive uh, papers or on Twitter even. The only difference is that right now with the Web2 system, uh, the value flow is dispersed because these are centralized platforms. But if you have a decentralized platform, uh, the fact of actually contributing with comments and so micro micro peer reviews or even more complex peer reviews could be uh, you know like rewarded and in this way the the recognition is not just material in terms of economic incentives but also could uh, form a reputation on the platform and this could be spendable for example in a new uh, impact factor system that doesn't recognize only the citations of a paper, but also um, peer review, because anyway, it's an essential, it's the essential uh, thing in science, right? Because we, without peer review, we don't have published papers. Um, yeah, so that's... Uh, uh, fantastic. <laughs> Really interesting. Thank you very much uh, for that. And I noticed some other contributions to the to the chat and to the questions focusing on a number of issues arising from this, like, for instance, bias um, and how that's affected by different models and so on. Before we go on to our next presentations, and thank you, uh, both speakers in the first half, really appreciate it. Before we go on to the next presentations, I'm going to suggest we take five minutes break so everybody can stretch their legs. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll have our second two speakers and further discussion as well. Thanks, everybody, for your contributions today. Let's take five minutes, shall we? Um, thanks very much. So we'll meet again at the turn of the hour. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Let's get going again. Uh, thanks very much again to our first two speakers. And now we move on to uh, the second part of, of the session. Uh, and Salmia is our next speaker, um, Salmia Swami Nathan from uh, Springer Nature. And she's gonna give us her perspective on these questions. So thank you very much, Salmia, over to you. Thanks, Stephen. I just want to say thanks to Wolfgang and Victoria for great presentations. I think we'll see actually some themes that were raised um, in their presentations echoed throughout. And also want to thank everyone for a great discussion so far. So I'm Samia Swaminathan, I'm Head of Editorial Policy at Nature and Springer Nature. Um, just by way of introduction to the Springer Nature Journals portfolio. So we publish some 3,000 plus journals across multiple imprints, around 300,000 plus articles per year across the breadth of research disciplines and working with a network of 750,000 peer reviewers per year. So we really feel we have an opportunity and a responsibility to push for reform and, and to scale. And we're in a position to really scale reform initiatives across diverse portfolios and diverse disciplines. Um, so just want to throw up the schematic from Brian's piece on strategy for culture change a couple of years ago. And what I hope to do is really talk about how publishers can use the levers of policy and infrastructure to shift norms in, in research communities, and then ultimately also through infrastructure, help drive toward a better user experience for, for researchers in all guises authors, reviewers, and also readers. So I'm going to tell you about three initiatives. One is in review, which is uh, an initiative developed in partnership with Research Square that focuses on journal integrated preprint sharing and transparency into peer review. Then I'll tell you a little bit about code peer review and how we've developed code peer review in a technology facilitated manner in working in partnership with Code Ocean. And then finally, I'll tell you a bit about transparency in peer review, what we are doing around transparency in publishing reviewer reports and recognizing reviewers, and as well as what we've learned about attitudes to transparency and recognition from researcher surveys. So it's an absolutely a team effort uh, at Springer Nature, and I just wanted to acknowledge at the outset the uh, contributions uh, of, of various people across Springer Nature, and, and also an early disclosure I'm on the advisory board of Research Square. So diving into uh, in review. So for a number of years, uh, the imprints across Springer Nature have had a very progressive, permissive policy toward preprints. In 2019, Springer Nature actually unified on a policy on preprints that encourages preprint deposition, that uh, supports CC BY licenses, that supports citation in reviews. But we wanted to also move toward an ethos where preprint posting was normative for the community. And so we worked with Research Square to set up a mechanism for authors to share their research as a preprint while under review. And that's really what in review is. It's journal integrated preprinting. Authors can opt in at submission through the submission system uh, to deposit the preprint, uh, which gets deposited, receives a DOI on the Research Square platform after undergoing uh, some quality control screens that are carried out either by Springer Nature staff or by Research Square. And because of the integration with the journal peer review system, authors receive a very high degree of transparency and real-time updates. And depending on uh, the, 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 the portfolio at Springer Nature, in review also offers a very high degree of public transparency in peer review, all the way from the submission through publication. So, for example, if you're at a BMC open access journal, uh, you can see the version of the, the preprint is deposited on the Research Square platform, and then versions that mature through revision are released in real time 
And there's a public peer review timeline that populates alongside the preprint on the Research Square platform. If this is a journal that then offers transparent peer review, once the paper is published, the peer review reports along with uh, reviewer names are released alongside the paper. So there's really a, a huge degree of transparency all the way from submission through publication. So what we learned, so in review is now offered across 486 Springer Nature journals. Uh, we're seeing an aggregate of 31% opt-in rates. This, uh, this is a snapshot from January to July of 2021. And a really important caveat that this opt-in data does not include data from scientific reports, which is one of our largest journals. In fact, it is the largest journal uh, in the Springer Nature portfolio. So there's a great deal of disciplinary variation in terms of opt-in. We're seeing opt-ins upward of 60% in some journals. Um, in reviews also available across all nature primary research journals. We're seeing an aggregate opt-in of 27% across the nature journals. And again, a range uh, going up to 37% in some disciplines and below 20% in others. Um, we're also, unfortunately, you can't really see the numbers for uh, the country opt-in data. That's strange, but I can tell you that we're seeing a very sharp uptake uh, uh, amongst researchers from China, around 40% uptake uh, in 2020, and that then falls off um, as we, as we uh, you know, progress down that list over there. So I just want to switch now and tell you about code peer review at Nature Journal. So code peer review was really developed um, in 2007 at Nature Methods, um, and the journal developed a policy and practice to peer review and share code when code was central to the paper. It's been established and in place at Nature Methods and Nature Biotechnology now for many years, over a decade. And alongside, we've developed resources to help authors submit code for peer review, including software submission checklist, guidance to authors on code peer review, guidance to reviewers. So it's a very kind of integrated part of the peer review process for these, for these journals that publish a lot of uh, papers where computational issues are front and center. But what we do know is that code peer review, the traditional way of code peer review that's not technology facilitated in any way can be quite cumbersome. And it's especially cumbersome for the reviewer who then has to find the code, set up the environment, install the dependencies, run and reproduce results. So even though we, it is, it's, a, it's a really critical feature of the peer review that's offered at this journal, at these journals, it is, it is uh, cumbersome and, and time consuming, labor intensive. So in 2018, we set up a pilot in partnership with CodeOcean, which offers a container platform uh, with executable functionality on three nature journals, Nature Medicine, Nature Biotechnology, Nature Methods. And the idea was really to uh, create a much better user experience for authors, for the reader, but especially for the reviewer as well. So in this facilitated environment where the code and the data is hosted in a container capsule in a, on the Code Ocean platform, the reviewer basically has a one step to uh, verify the code. And this can be done anonymously uh, while the code is hosted in a private environment. And then when the paper is published, the, the version that is associated with that paper is locked down, it receives a DOI, and it's you know, bi-directionally linked as a research output from the published paper. So um, what we found in the course of that pilot, and this is a snapshot of data from the three journals that we ran this trial on, is, is very positive feedback from both authors as well as reviewers. We really found that this technology-assisted way of peer-reviewing code um, 
was really facilitated the process. 54% of all authors from across the journals opted into the trial. Um, and and it, it has really made the process a lot more seamless um, from submission all the way to publication. So we've now expanded the facilitated code peer review that is in partnership with Code Ocean to six journals, to six nature journals, nature, nature biotechnology, nature methods, nature protocols, nature computational science and nature machine intelligence. These are all journals where computational reproducibility is often very critical. We've also expanded the practice of code peer review to 19 nature journals. And I think uh, the, the, uh, the experience we've had in delivering uh, a technology enabled solution for code peer review has been quite important in sort of expanding the practice of code peer review itself across our journals. So with, with these two examples, I hope you can see how we as publishers are really using policy first to, to lead with, but then also developing infrastructure enabled solutions to shift communities towards open and transparent research practices. So now I'd like to talk about what we're doing with respect to transparency in peer review and what we've learned from publishing peer review reports in the first instance. So Biomed Central, which is uh, a part of Springer Nature, has been publishing peer review reports now for over 20 years. They were an early pioneering publisher in posting peer review reports and reviewer names. Nature Communications first introduced publishing peer review reports in 2016. That practice has now been extended to Nature and a number of Nature research journals in the last couple of years. What we're learning from the practice of publishing peer review reports is that there's a great degree of disciplinary variability. Um, it's, it's available as an optional practice across our journals, and we're seeing a, a real range in uptake across disciplines. It grow, goes up to 80% in some areas and uh, around 40 to 50% in others. Um, nevertheless, over the years, we're seeing a real shift to a transparency. So as of 2019 at Nature Communications, we were seeing overall aggregate uptake uh, of around 70%. And we also know in surveys that we've done with authors that there's a great uh, desire for transparency. And I just want to give you some numbers. So 78% of researchers and surveys uh, have said that they would be comfortable with an anonymous review, with, with reviewing for a journal that released an anonymous review. 38% feel that openness and peer review is beneficial and improves the quality of the output. And 44% of reviewers from China, of researchers from China, actually also find openness as beneficial. So the trend towards greater transparency and transparency as beneficial to the system is, is really becoming clear. And that, that's a sea change certainly for me from the days that I first started at Nature. So I also want to tell you a little bit about a second area of transparency and recognition uh, at the Nature Journals, and that's publishing reviewer names. So in 2017, we initiated a pilot at Nature that allowed peer reviewers to have their names formally acknowledged on the published paper. And the goal was twofold. One, to provide transparency into the process, and two, to recognize the contributions of reviewers in peer reviewing this work. So a three-year snapshot of data, we found that 91% of nature authors opted into the pilot. 55% of reviewers opted in, and approximately 80% of nature papers have at least one reviewer named on the paper. So we wanted to understand a little bit more about the authors and reviewers who took part. And we were really um, 
what we really also wanted to get at was whether uh, the system of of the, the the pilot the initiative to allow authors reviewers to disclose their names on papers whether that was creating or distorting existing uh, inequities in the system. And what we found was actually there isn't a great difference across the demographics we looked at. Uh, men and women authors were opting in at around the same rates. Women and men reviewers were agreeing to be named uh, around 50 to 56%. There wasn't a great difference in uh, career stage in reviewers uh, agreeing to be opting in to being named uh, in terms of career stage. Um, and then we also surveyed our reviewers to understand a bit more about their attitudes toward reviewer transparency and recognition, particularly uh, in relation to naming reviewers. 78% of our reviewers felt that naming reviewers would result in better written reports. 68% felt that this would improve transparency and 52% uh, said that they would consider being named if given an option. So this pilot is no longer a pilot. It's, it's now been integrated into, into all nature journals. So all nature journals now allow give reviewers the option and opportunity to be named on the published paper. So just to summarize, what we've learned from uh, these three efforts, as well as others, is that publishers can use levers of policy and infrastructure to help shift community norms. Of course, that doesn't happen in isolation. And it most definitely happens in synergy with changes that are occurring in the community. And we've seen this most clearly in relation to, to preprints, but also other areas like reproducibility. Researchers support and embrace open research practices, preprints, code, but infrastructure and user experience can be important considerations when trying to uh, encourage uptake. There's very significant support for transparency across many researcher demographics, gender, career stage, geography, and across communities of researchers, i.e. authors and reviewers. We see considerable variability in norms and, and sort of trends towards openness and transparency across disciplines, which I think is, um, is, is not surprising, but it's an important consideration for us as journal editors and publishers when we think about introducing new initiatives and when we think about how we want to work with the researcher community towards shifting norms. So with that, I think that's my last slide. With that, I will stop sharing. Thank you very much indeed, Sam. You're really interesting um, and a whole variety of interesting questions arising from that. Um, we've got a, a couple of questions from Mario and I, I want to ask you one of them now and suggest you maybe address the other one uh, by typing in an answer in just a moment. But the one I'd like you to address is the one about um, whether you've explored why Chinese researchers are more likely to opt in to in review compared with other countries or whether you've done any analysis of the of the reasons behind the country differences in some of the experiments you've, you've talked about. Yeah, it's very, very interesting and it really does stand out. And um, it is different also to, I believe, what uh, BioArchive and MedArchive might be seeing, where actually, from what I can remember from data from BioArchive, it's really a trend towards researchers in um, in the US and Europe. I don't, I don't, we, we, we don't fully understand why that is. We are in the process of actually reviewing, uh, surveying our in review authors. Uh, and so hopefully we'll get some more insight there. And I'm, I just want to throw something out for speculation. It's entirely speculative, not based on data. But I think trust with researchers is really important. Right. And, and, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of preprints. I think that they are really for the good of the research community. But I think there's still a lot of nervousness around 
about early sharing of data, about the potential for that to end up, you know, scooping the author and, and whatnot. So I just wonder if, if the journal integrated uh, approach creates a greater degree of comfort. I don't know. I actually don't know. And it may just be that it's, it's because it's integrated into the workflow, it's just more convenient. But it's a very good question. The numbers are striking. I don't entirely, I don't have a good answer. Mm. Well, your answer absolutely brilliantly cues up John, although. So um, <laughs> it seems to me that it would be good to move on, John, to your presentation now. Mario, I've noticed your comment about really wanting um, Samia to have a go answering the question about the availability of the reports in other forms. So uh, could I invite you, Samia, to maybe address that in by typing in an answer? And I've noticed some other questions relating to some big picture issues around scaling up, for example, which we'll come to, I hope, after John's presentation. But John, can I invite you now to make your contribution? And then we'll engage in some panel-wide discussion as well. And as keep the questions coming in, please do. And after this presentation, I'm hoping we'll be able to bring one or two members of the audience in as well to switch on our mics and contribute. John, over to you. Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you um, to the conference for the opportunity to participate in this session. Uh, very interesting, and I hope I don't, uh, I'm not responsible for lowering the quality of presentations here. Um, good afternoon from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York, uh, where it is a fall day very much like this. Um, the laboratory is, has a long history of being a research institution, but for all of its history, it has also been a place where scientists came to share and communicate their science. And I've just listed some of the milestones in that process here. And believe it or not, all of these things are still going on, even the oldest ones. But I'm here really to talk at Stephen's invitation about case histories. And I'm going to uh, talk, uh, case studies, I should say. And I'm going to talk about two things, one a journal and one a preprint server. The journal is uh, Life Science Alliance. Uh, it is three years old. It is a gold open access uh, journal in biomedicine. Um, and it was launched uh, jointly uh, by Embo Press, Rockefeller Press, and Coldspring Harbor Laboratory Press. Um, this was um, the product of some uh, lengthy discussion about how we might do this and why we might do this. But we all decided that we were interested in this experiment. And so we uh, set about forming uh, an organization to uh, publish this journal. The, the publication model has uh, two professional editors uh, in-house, one in uh, Cold Spring Harbor and one in Heidelberg, and uh, young uh, principal investigators in both uh, Europe and the United States. Um, LSA, as we call it, has uh, two editorial processes, one the conventional direct submission that everyone here is familiar with, and the response to that, of course, is either a polite decline or um, request for uh, peer review. But um, the more interesting and innovative part of this is that we also um, have developed a process we call informed transfer of papers from the partner's nine uh, journals, what we call them frontline journals. These are all um, highly regarded journals in their respective disciplines, and they're all hybrid. In other words, they, they give authors the option of uh, open access, but also have uh, a sustaining subscription uh, process. So informed transfer essentially starts when an author submits to one of the frontline journals, and she is given the option to uh, opt in to subsequent LSA consideration if uh, her paper does not uh, make it at that frontline journal. Um, once the editors have gone through their standard, the frontline journal editors have gone through their standard process, um, they select which of the papers they decline to recommend to LSA. And these papers may come with reviews, or maybe they were desk rejected. But the LSA editors are, um, are exposed to those papers and they decide within two days whether they have uh, a willingness to commit to review that paper or not. 
The authors are then informed about that interest, uh, confirm that they want to proceed, and then the uh, LSA editors continue either with uh, commissioning uh, peer reviews if the paper doesn't already have them, or if there are reviews, the LSA editors may accept uh, those, the, the paper on the basis of their reviews with either no or very minor revisions, or they may decline to accept because they feel that there are major revisions uh, still required. So the uh, informed transfer process really combines the idea of portable submission, where the authors know exactly where their paper might go if it doesn't work at the first place they submitted it, and also portable peer review, because the, uh, the reviews go with the manuscript if they, are, if they exist. Um, so the benefits uh, of this process we feel for authors are that the, it, it avoids the very well-known um, phenomenon of serial, serial resubmission with all of that, that involves. It accelerates the time to publication. It also means we are not um, an unduly burdening our reviewers. And all in all, it is seen as a, as a service to authors, which was what motivated the three partner uh, publishers to uh, set it up in the first place. Once the LSA peer review process takes place, then there are a number of features of it, and I, I, don't, I won't go through all of these in detail. Um, we uh, encourage uh, reviewers to talk to each other about their recommendations, feeling that in that dialogue can emerge a realistic set of recommendations to authors um, that is basically asking for essential changes to be made only. Um, we also have a process of um, screening for data integrity. Um, source data were mentioned earlier in the afternoon. Um, authors are encouraged to submit that source data for, um, uh, with their papers. But if reviewers have questions about the data, then the source, uh, have questions about figures, then source data must be submitted. Um, we do do transparent peer review, which involves the public posting of the reviews, author responses and decision letters, and authors can be named if they so wish. Um, there is preprint support in the sense that um, authors may submit directly to LSA and to BioArchive at the same time. Um, we've extended the scooping protection process that was basically articulated by Embo Press, in which uh, the decision on a manuscript is not influenced by the a similar paper elsewhere. And we also consider um, manuscripts that have been reviewed in a journal agnostic fashion by the Review Commons project that Victoria talked about earlier. And we are also now involved with the SAP Bio through their uh, new uh, preprint reviewer network, which is a way essentially of um, enabling early career recept, uh, uh, researchers to demonstrate that they have reviewer capabilities and have that work be transmitted to a network of journals. So um, a summary of this as a case study, we are three years in and we feel that LSA is really doing a very satisfactory job. We've published over 500 papers, the volume is growing. We've been able to expand the editorial team this first impact factor now of, of a decent uh, uh, a number. Um, the journal is comfortably in the black. And the amazing thing is that three highly independent and opinionated publishing organizations have managed to remain friends while working together, but also while being independent. So the challenges involved in setting all of this up was you know, the inevitable challenge of decision-making amongst uh, uh, multiple organizations. Uh, we had to deal with the technology challenges of different manuscript handling systems amongst the journals. Um, we had to decide how to divide up the, the general labor of publishing a journal amongst the partners. Um, perhaps the hardest thing was getting to, uh, was articulating what standards were expected by LSA so that the um, frontline journal editorial teams could figure out what papers they should be recommending. And that took a while, but it has, uh, it isn't really no longer an issue. And of course, beyond all of that, we had the always uh, difficult task of getting authors comfortable with the idea of a brand new journal, particularly one that worked in a slightly unusual way. 
So uh, we feel that the principal lessons are that, that authors have seen and welcomed the benefits of this informed transfer process. And I think we can also conclude that um, the, the recipient journal, namely LSA, can have an editorial process and a peer review and even a business model that um, are different from the ways that all of these things are done in the upstream uh, journals. So we're very happy with the way that LSA has gone. And if there are any journal representatives in the audience, we would be very delighted to talk to other publishers and other journals about participating in this project. Let me turn now to um, BioArchive. You've heard a lot about preprints this afternoon, and I don't need to elaborate on this slide, except to say that a preprint, of course, is posted um, before peer review, and the benefits of that are its very rapid distribution and the fact that really every aspect of the manuscript is under the control of the, and its distribution um, are under the control of, of the authors with the possibility of community feedback through a variety of mechanisms. So BioArchive was launched uh, in 2013. Uh, it's a not-for-profit project. Uh, community-based, it's funded by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and fortunately by the uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, as of preprint servers are, the reading and posting is free, but we see this as an author service in essence. It's not a product, it's not a publication, and it's not a component of a journal submission, but, but an independent entity, independent of publishers and journals, but nevertheless, with strong integration, namely manuscript transfers to and from um, an expanding number of journals currently numbering over 200. Um, as a preprint, a manuscript is not peer reviewed, but it is screened through a multi-step process involving um, an in-house team uh, of science, scientifically qualified people, uh, plus a group of 180 principal investigators in a variety of disciplines throughout the world. So the manuscript only appears on BioArchive after it has been seen and approved by that group of people. Uh, we are aiming to get a manuscript up in 48 hours after its submission. And once it's there, the authors can revise it as many times as they like until the manuscript is accepted by a journal. Um, a couple um, my colleague Richard Sever, Mike Eisen, and I um, wrote a paper um, which was mostly concerned at the time with access to scientific information at a time when all the discussion was about Plan and S. Uh, we somewhat tongue in cheek called it Plan U for universal. Um, but as part of that consideration, we made the comment in, in the article that. When there, are, when there is a critical mass of preprints, then you have a fertile environment for doing peer review in a different kind of way and evolving new and different ways of research evaluation. And that is made easier because the hosting and the archive of the manuscripts themselves is taken care of by the preprint server. So, in the past two years, there is no question, and you've heard this already from um, earlier speakers, preprints are definitely doing exactly what we had um, thought might happen. They are accelerating innovation and evaluation. And the, the pandemic has added impetus to that. Um, Victoria alluded to a couple of these pandemic-related preprint assessment projects that have taken root at Mount Sinai, um, in Oxford at, at, at the um, project at Johns Hopkins and also MIT Press's uh, CCR19 uh, uh, re uh, review journal. Um, there are also um, projects that predate the pandemic um, that are specific, specifically oriented towards early career researchers, pre-lights and pre-review. And there are a growing number of organizations that have an arrangement with BioArchive by which they can post the peer reviews that they commission on pre-printed manuscripts back to the appropriate preprint on BioArchive itself, a project we call 
transparent review and preprints or TRIP. In fact, eLife has gone further, as you may well know, by articulating a new policy in which they will now only review uh, for, uh, they will only consider manuscripts that have been pre-printed. And Victoria alluded to the new ASAP bio um, crowd review in which um, authors of, of bioarchive manuscripts are given the opportunity to request a community uh, uh, review. And we also have just recently introduced a, a new function on bioarchive in which an author can um, request a specialized kind of evaluation from what we hope will become a growing list of organizations that offer to do that kind of specialized evaluation. The first up is Dataseer, which um, looks at the uh, data in a given paper and makes recommendations on where that should be, that data should be deposited most appropriately. So what we are trying to do on BioArchive is assist readers by aggregating the varying forms of evaluation that are emerging around an individual preprint. So some of that is what you might call classic peer review, and that involves author opt-in, and that's being done, for example, by Eli and review comments. And in that case, the, the content of the reviews uh, is displayed on the manuscript. Then there's another form of review, the, what you might call community review, which may but may not have author opt-in. Pre-lights and pre-review are uh, part of that, in which case what is displayed on BioArchive is the link to the content on a separate site. Then there are the automated tools that, uh, that authors uh, wish to take advantage of, such as Dataseer, in which case the content will be displayed, but there are other kinds of automated tools emerging which do not involve author opt-in. And in that case, we will display the link to wherever that evaluation lives. Then of course there are blogs and the link is displayed there and tweets where we, we display both the link and uh, the snippet. So what that essentially looks like is um, we have recently uh, sort of revised the UX here. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a set of icons um, that contain uh, symbols of these different kinds of evaluations and a, numer a number that shows how many there are. Uh, this appears on underneath uh, on every bioarchive manuscript. And if you click on one of those icons, then it will bring up the uh, tab on a dashboard that are appropriate to the thing that you clicked on. So in this case, it was the community reviews and here are some links to pre-review and uh, pre-lights um, evaluations. And you can see there are comments and um, blogs, no automated um, assessments here, but lots and lots of tweets on this particular paper. No, no trip because this was, this was not part of that process. But when there is um, when there are trip evaluations, then the dashboard uh, that comes up alongside the paper reveals the content of the reviews themselves, as as you can see. So um, this is a rather a hasty um, skate through um, a lot of stuff. But um, if I if I'm trying to sum up, sum up what we have learned so far from BioArchive and the attempt to aggregate. Um, reviews and evaluation, well, it's very clear that there is a growing interest uh, in public assessment of preprints. And there is also, therefore, a growing number of peer review preprints. In fact, we have 2000 of them on BioArchive already. And more organizations and groups and individual people are engaging in this process and thinking about how best to do it, as you have heard from Victoria and others. So the nat but the nature of the assessment varies from the comment, um, which we post on the site, uh, to the kind of commentary, contextual commentary that you might get in pre-lights or pre-review, to the more rigorous analysis that you would get from a, what a process that is a sort of recognizably formal peer review. The where those um, the, where that content lives varies from Twitter to independent websites to uh, being on BioArchive itself. And 
as I've said, some of these assessments are requested by authors, but some are not. Um, and the interesting thing, I think, and the thing that is the challenge going forward, is that some of these assessments has the effect of changing the manuscript status from unpublished to published. So perhaps for further discussion, and particularly among the, the audience who thinks about these kinds of issues uh, deeply, what do we mean when we say that something is published? Um, conventionally, that means certification uh, or endorsing or take, somehow taking responsibility for the content having gone generally through a process of peer review. It, it usually involves, or in fact always it, well, at, at the moment, involves uh, take, applying to this piece of work a different DOI that is not the DOI that the preprint server attached to it. And then there's a kind of social contract with the author because published means the creation of what is still called a version of record. And in that social contract, the author commits not to republish the paper in another venue with or without modifications. So the, I think the, going forward, we are going to be grappling with some interesting questions. Who gets to publish? And journals obviously do, but what about an individual? Um, if I set myself up as an arbiter uh, and say uh, that my, um, my uh, uh, reaction to a particular piece of work uh, is X, does that, do, am I then a publisher? Um, what about a group of individuals? What about an academic institution? And what is it that endows uh, any of these entities with the right to call themselves a publisher? And I think over, under, uh, under all of these considerations is the, the inevitable question about the nature of manuscript assessment as it affects scientists' career. We all know how inextricably bound up with the process of publication uh, career advancement is. And I think we have opportunities with the emergence of preprints to begin to unwind some of that. Uh, current uh, in intricacy and uh, figure out new ways in which we might provide recognition for contributions to science and to the scientific community. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present these remarks. I will turn it back to Stephen. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Thanks for those uh, for, for guiding us through those innovations and also for raising those really interesting big picture questions as well around trust and authority and uh, quality and incentives, because I think that's those are some of the really key issues that we're, that we're dealing with here, aren't we? Um, could I invite you to um, uh, put your questions to members of the panel? Also, if you want to make a contribution, you're very welcome to do that. So please do raise your hand and while you're thinking about that and I'd maybe encourage so, some of you have contributed to the chat or maybe raise questions to to think about contributing uh, Dorothy Bishop for example raised a really interesting point around uh, the, the where at what point in the research process um, peer review should occur I'm, I'm particularly favoring registered reports that are very uh, research design a very early stage of that and it'd be really interesting to hear from you Dorothy to to, to say why you, you feel that. Um, we've got some very interesting questions that have partly been addressed uh, through people typing in answers, but are probably worth us um, revisiting as well as, as a panel. And one of them from Tom Stafford relates to this issue of um, incentives or barriers to carrying out peer review. That is for publishers or other similar organizations carrying out more innovation in the peer review area. What are the what are the incentives? What are the barriers for undertaking innovation in this area, and how can they be overcome? Would anybody like to um, address that uh, to begin with? Somia, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think actually publishers are doing a lot. Um, it's not the case, and I don't just—I don't mean just Springer Nature, but across the ecosystem. You know, if you look at Reviews Commons, that's that's a publisher-driven innovation, very interesting one in partnership with BioArchive. Uh, so I I do think publishers are doing a lot. 
And I'm not sure that more innovation is necessarily what's needed, but perhaps better innovation in the sense that innovation that's more coordinated, even across publishers, uh, perhaps more systematized. I mean, I think Wolfgang's talk really highlighted sort of the chaotic nature of innovation, right? We're all doing transparent peer review, but we're all doing it in a slightly different way, uh, which means actually when we look at research institutions or others in the ecosystem wanting to build on that, make sense of that, it becomes challenging. So I think perhaps what's needed is not more innovation, but more coordinated, targeted solutions a better way of really identifying the core issues at stake and then working together, not just in siloed ways, you know, one publisher or a group of publishers, but with funders and institutions. So that, you know, you can, you can really talk about change across the sector. Mm. Wolfgang, I know you've done a, a bit of thinking about the nature of innovation in this space. Well, I would like to add something actually to the question about uh, incentives. I think it's important to also see uh, um, innovation in peer view, not as a kind of a self-contained uh, kind of area. I think uh, it's important to see peer view as part of a scholarly process. And I think um, uh, peer review practices are very much shaped by other elements of uh, the scholarly process. So for example, by the emphasis that is put on authorship uh, and if I had to uh, sort of identify a very general problem that I see in peer review is uh, the fact that it's hard to get people to do it. And that has a lot to do with what is uh, valued, which is a problem of authorship and of uh, publishing rather than peer review itself. So one way of um, uh, stimulating innovation, useful innovation in peer review, I think, would be also to think of uh, the environment of peer review, uh, like publishing and how to sort of de-emphasize perhaps uh, uh, some of the issues uh, that, that have to do with, with publishing. Mm. Victoria. Yeah, I'm also going to echo some of what Salmia has mentioned is um, um, perhaps maybe um, pure sheer number of more innovations is not going to be as informative as understanding which innovations have been successful and getting more data out of these experiments. So many of the platforms that launch um, don't necessarily see themselves as purely just an experiment. And I think what's really important to do is track your usage, track which strategies work, which changes and perturbations and peer review process is actually effective by engaging users or producing better quality of review. So I think a huge um, missing piece in this space is um, better uh, recording of their information of the data and reporting of this outcome. So I think that will teach us a lot about overall which strategies are important and which directions to go to in the future. One of the things I'm interested to ask you all about is um, the relationship between preprint servers and journals, which a number of the presentations you've given have touched on. Is there beginning to emerge a sort of idealized relationship between the two in terms of process, workflows, uh, and so on? Or do you think a whole variety of different models uh, will emerge and persist in this area? You'd like to have a go at that one. John? Maybe I could um, start the process anyway. Um, I think this is a, an emerging and an evolving, it's an evolving area. There's no, no question about that. And, and the pipelines that I referred to are really very simple um, processes in which um, a, a manuscript can be, an author can choose from now, as I said, over 200 journals to um, so very simply send the manuscript and associated information to the submission system of one of, of a, a journal of her choice. Um, this is a process that has been extremely um, heavily used. I, 
don't actually have numbers in the top of my head as to uh, how frequently, and, but it's, it's in the many thousands, the tens of thousands now. And um, it's a process that many authors like because um, it doesn't resemble the typical submission to a journal, which um, a, a direct submission to a journal is often a rather tortured process. Uh, this is a rather simple process. Now it doesn't transfer all the information to the journal that the journal wants, but uh, it gives the, uh, the journal an opportunity to have a first look at the manuscript and at least to say, thank you, but this is out of scope, not what we're looking for and so on. So there's a certain contribution to efficiency there, both on the side of the journal and also on behalf of the author. So I think that's a useful contribution and some, um, obviously we, the preprint server values the opportunity to serve its authors in that way. And the journals seem to like this process, more and more of them are signing up to, to doing this. Um, I think journals probably uh, need to answer the question more directly, is this really useful? You know, I mean, you, you have to ask journal editors if they are weighed down by things that they, under normal circumstances, would never see. But I think there are some efficiencies there on both for two of the stakeholders uh, in, the, in the process. I don't see any reason why that shouldn't continue. Any other contributions to that question of the relationship between preprint servers and journals? You know, I, I think that they have the preprints, the advent of preprints, and they've been around for a long time in some communities. But I think they've they've pushed journals to do more and to to also open up or to open up their policies, be more innovative. So I think that's they have disrupt they've had a disruptive influence. And I think that's that's only good for researchers and the research community and the publishing industry as well. Mm. I, I, you know, we at Nature have had preprints alongside uh, since archive began. So I think there's always been a degree of comfort and support for preprints. Uh, let's leave out, you know, statements made in the 60s, but, but certainly, you know, the first editorial that, that we published on preprints was in the, in the uh, early 90s I think um, and I think it's 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 certainly been absolutely fantastic through the pandemic we've seen that it's been transformative really um, I think there are some areas that you know we we kind of talk about a lot and that's community peer review and I think it's fair to say that the promise of that hasn't really borne out it's certainly the case that certain preprints attract community attention. And certainly in the context of the pandemic, there have been COVID preprints that have attracted that kind of really intense scrutiny and it's been absolutely fantastic, right? And there's been very quick uh, response, uh, much quicker than let's say feasible in a, in a journal capacity. But by and large, preprints don't attract comment. They don't attract community input. So I think that's an area where the promise of what's possible is still very much an open question. And I think then there are also issues around <laughs> equity that Victoria raised. So I think, you know, I think they're fantastic, a very important uh, addition to the scholarly uh, communication space. And I think There'll be many opportunities for synergy between preprints and journals. Samia, could I take issue with one of the things you just said? Um, a bit Please. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think when it comes to assessing whether there's a community reaction to a preprint, it depends very much where you look. I think you're absolutely right. There is no, there is very little public com direct commenting, although when something really attracts attention, there is often on BioArchive a huge outpouring of comments, um, yeah. <laughs> particularly if something is, is, is poor or wrong. But 
um, if you look on Twitter, I would yes. say there's been a massive evolution in the quality of the discourse um, on Twitter around individual preprints. And I think that's only getting better as scientists begin to learn how to use Twitter for their own purposes. There are, tweet, there are fantastic tutorials on, you know, that break down a complex manuscript in bite-sized chunks on Twitter and make it yeah. very much more accessible to a bigger audience. But then the other thing is the extent of private communication with preprint authors, which in surveys that we've done suggests are by far the most mm. common form of, of public, of the far the most common form of reaction to a preprint is private email and not something that is public. So there could be in the future, some public, some uh, community shift towards more open um, commentary of the sort that the author gets privately, which might make it, the comment much more useful for the community at large. Mm. That's a really so, good thank you, John. For yeah, uh, uh, and actually some research that I've been involved with recently as well to do with Rory confirms that issue uh, that he raised around the most common form of commenting is via private means, emails particularly. Um, so uh, yeah, absolutely. Now we've only got a few minutes left and I want to deal with one other question which has been answered by Victoria in the uh, Q&A form, but also I'd like to raise more generally, which is raised by Alavo, which is a really interesting issue around does the concept of peer review itself as a kind of unified entity, is that, is, is that problematical? Shouldn't we think about this as a, a, a more heterogeneous thing than just a, rather than a hom homogeneous one? And I, I'd be interested in your sort of um, summative thoughts on that and, and how that relates to, to the future uh, as well, because we are talking about lots of different ways of carrying out reviews and how those can be situated in the whole landscape, which is becoming increasingly interesting, it seems to me. So, uh, Victoria, you've commented on that. So can I ask you to speak to that for a minute or so, and then I'll turn to the other panel members as well. Yeah, so my, uh, my first thoughts are, uh, with this day and age, I think many people are publishing more methods or data sets or increasingly new and diverse types of research outputs. And I think it is very important to think of it as um, very differently from a classical manuscript, which may be a full package story. So in that case, um, we can think more about a more customizable, flexible approach to doing review on different and varying new um, types of research outputs. So I, I think we shouldn't do a one size fits all review of all research outputs and they could be separately experimented on. And that was my uh, point here. Yeah. Anybody else like to comment on that point around the heterogeneity of the, of the review process that's emerging? I, um, if I could say a little word. Uh, sorry, uh, Samio, you go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, John. Um, I think um, just briefly, I think what we're seeing is the emergence of a difference between um, peer review for publication and peer review for the purpose of the quality and advancement of science. And those are two different things sometimes. Um, we are very hung up on peer review for publication, but, and publication, goodness knows, is very important for career development. But ultimately what science is about is the advancement of knowledge and um, what is truth. And that could be what we are seeing as we get more community engagement in the expression of scientific work, we're, we're, we're less about publication and more about progress. Sammy, just very briefly from you. I was just going to agree with everything Victoria said and actually pick up on a point that was made at an ALPSB session we were at this morning around whether all papers need to be peer reviewed in the same way, which I think, you know, builds on the point that Victoria and Barbara made about heterogeneity and peer review mm -hmm. and the need for that. Fantastic. We've really got to close there. I'm very sorry because we've got so many interesting comments and questions coming in. Thank you, everybody, for your contribution. 
Uh, please join me with, with me in thanking virtually all of our speakers. Thank you for your fantastic contributions. And thank you everybody who's attended for your questions and your engagement. I do hope we can find other fora to continue this conversation as well. And we'll be following each other's work, I've no doubt, with real interest. So thank you very much, everybody. I was going to say have a good evening, but for many of you, it's not an evening. So have a good rest of the day. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.